How do you do that? Lose your entire family, your daughter's involved in the conspiracy and the murdering, and you forgive her, and you forgive the two boys that murdered your family. That's not easy. Actually, it's quite impossible if you don't have faith. And so we started this series last week, and we're going to continue on today and over the next couple of weeks at looking at forgiveness because it's a part of who we are for those of us that follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because ultimately he gave his life for us to be forgiven. And he went through the same pain and struggles that this, this young man, Terry, went through when he lost his family and had the ability and the strength to be able to forgive this young man. It's an amazing testimony. Terry now serves in ministry. He's a pastor. He visits his daughter in prison once a month when she gets her time, two hours or whatever it is. So he's living out his faith through the forgiveness and the power of forgiveness that he has shown to those that harmed him so deeply and it's having a tremendous impact on others who are struggling with forgiveness and all kinds of other issues in life now as i was walking through this and searching through this and trying to figure out what we were going to talk about today i came across a passage of scripture that talks about forgiveness and and i'm going to be honest with you this is a very 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 difficult passage for those of us that are christians and the crazy thing is is that it's right after one of the greatest passages that we as Christians claim. And it's right after the Lord's Prayer. And so we're going to see something very unique today that jumped out on the page to me, that the Lord's Prayer, which is something that so many of us hold so dear, and you know, at one point we, we prayed it in the schools, and we pray it on a regular basis. I pray it every single day. And it's something that's a part of who we are. And that prayer is directly linked to forgiveness. So if you'd like to follow along this morning, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 5 and following. And so we're very familiar with, with this passage of Scripture, at least the first part. In verse 5, it says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they will have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not, pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now here's the hard part. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Great. Verse 15. This is the hard one. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Wow. Now, for those of you that are Christians and have been following Jesus for a while, this is a very difficult passage because we believe a lot of other things because it talks about that when we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, into our lives, we're forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. And when you make mistakes, you go back to Jesus and you ask for forgiveness. And it's like Jesus will forgive you no matter what you do. There's only one sin that's unforgivable according to the New Testament, and that's the sin grieving the Holy Spirit. We're not even sure what that is. The basic assumption is whatever is so bad that you'll know when you're doing it, <laughs> you're doing it. But other than that, it's pretty clear in the Bible that there's nothing you can do or have done in the past that can make it so that you can't be forgiven. And you have this one scripture that comes after the Lord's Prayer that says, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. What do you do with that? Well, it's a theological question because, as you can well imagine, commentators and Christians and theologians have been thinking and wrestling with this for a long time because it is a one-off. This is the only place you find this. When, when the Lord's Prayer comes up in the book of Luke, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, the other gospel, it doesn't have this passage of Scripture in it. 
So it's the one-off spot where it comes in here and it's written, it says, exactly this. And so what do you do with that? Well, here's just a couple of options that people, as they've been thinking and processing, how do, you, how do you rationalize this? How does this line up with our faith and the rest of the systems that we believe in our faith about forgiveness? So here's the first option when you read this. You can, you can believe that this unforgiveness that's, talking, that's being talked about here isn't about salvation. So what the, the theologians are saying is, is that what it means is, is that as you read through this, it's, it's about prayers about between you and God, the relationship between you and God. You're supposed to go into your closet. You're supposed to build this relationship with God, not show it off between other, for other people to see. It's a relationship between you and God. So when Matthew writes this, what he's saying is you've got this relationship between you and God, and if you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, it's going to break your relationship with God, and it's going to make it so that you're not going to be able to hear his voice or a whole bunch of other applications that fall out when you're disconnected from God. So some theologians go, look, this is what this passage is talking about. It's not talking about where you're going to end up, heaven or hell. It's not talking about salvation, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. It's talking about the relationship that you have with God. And therefore, you don't have to worry about it, basically. That the forgiveness of Jesus Christ was done on the cross. You can look up John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son and he did it to forgive you. There's a whole bunch of passages that talk about this. It's not our righteousness. You can't earn forgiveness. You can't go to people and forgive them so that you earn your way into heaven. That's not what this is about. This is about your relationship with God. And that if you break that relationship by holding on to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, it's going to impact your relationship with God. It's one option. Another option is some theologians say, hey, anybody who gets to this point in your life where you cannot forgive somebody else for whatever they've done, it's because you actually never knew Jesus Christ in the first place. You never experienced his forgiveness. And so what's going on here is they're basically just saying, hey, you know what? If you can't forgive somebody else, then you never knew Jesus in the first place. And you never received God's forgiveness. And then there's a third option. It actually means exactly what it says. At some point you came to faith. Some point you received forgiveness and then something bad went on in life or something even happened before that and you just hold on to this bitterness and resentment and it's tainted you and it's eating you alive and it's destroying you. And ultimately when you stand before God someday, it will be the thing that will separate you between him and you. So we're not exactly sure what it means, ultimately. But it raises the importance and the value of forgiveness, that this is not a game. That this is the crux of our faith. Matthew elevates it to one of the major distinctions between us and every other faith system in the world and raises it to the level where this actually matters, that you cannot hold on to unforgiveness. Because it's going to do something to you. And so the question then is, as we look at this, is because it's so closely tied to this, the Lord's Prayer, is what does this mean for us? How can we live lives of forgiveness rather than going down the path of what this means? Why don't we focus on living a life of forgiveness and how you do that? So here's just a couple of things that come straight out of the Lord's Prayer that deal with forgiveness in our lives. And this is how you deal with forgiveness. This is how you live it. First of all, I love it, and we we know the Lord's Prayer. God, your will be done. You know, one of the problems with unforgiveness, one of the problems with holding bitterness and resentment against another human being is it becomes all about you. It's about what that person did to me or what they took from me or how the, they need to have vengeance or how vengeance needs to be put back onto them, how justice has, injustice has been done to me and now there needs to be justice. And so we take it and all the focus all of a sudden becomes on our life, our problem, what somebody did to us and we dwell on it, we internalize it and it becomes our will in our life and that's not what we're supposed to pray. Your will be done. 
That's the only way somebody like Terry could do that. He's lost his family. He's lost everything. He lost his house. I don't even know where they had insurance. He's got a daughter that's betrayed him that was part of the murder scheme who's in prison. He has lost absolutely everything. How do you not take that type of crisis and let it impact you and internalize you so much so that it taints you and it makes you useless for the rest of your life? Because you're so bitter and so angry about what I've lost, about me, about me, about me, about me, about me, about me, about me. And many people would say he has every right to think that way. But I love it when he says that God has a plan for this. I'm not quite sure I would have that type of strength to be able to basically say in that statement, your will be done, God. I don't know. I don't understand. I'm at loss. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I've lost everything, but I'm going to forgive because God, somehow you're going to bring good out of this. That's crazy. He recognizes God's sovereignty. He recognizes that God's will is to be done. Think about it this way. For those of you that are athletes, A basketball coach could call a timeout, apparently, I'm not much of a basketball player, but I did play for, you know, on and off. But a a basketball coach can call a timeout any time for any number of reasons in, in 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 a ball game. He might see a flaw in the opponent's defense, for example, that he thinks his team can exploit so he can call out a timeout. Uh, he might also stop a flurry of momentum or a hot hand by one of the opposing uh, players by calling a timeout. He might try and use it to try and icy, uh, uh, put ice on a free throw shooter. He might use it to stop the clock near the end of a half or time or regulation. He might use it to force an instant replay review of a questionable call by the officials, but he has has the power to call a timeout whenever he wants. That's six game options, different game options right there. And again, that's not extensive and I'm not a basketball player. But they're all determined not by fixed logarithms, but by the flow of the game, the nature of the opponent, the time left on the shot of the clock or the game clock. Any of these factors and many others could dictate his purpose in asking for stoppage in the play. Plus, it's all dictated by the coach's unique personal knowledge of his players, his awareness of what each of them can do, what makes them perform best, what puts them in the best position to win the game. It's very much like God in this game of life. Because he sees the bigger picture. He knows you intimately. He knows the game that's going on around your life. He knows all the players. He knows their strengths. He knows their weaknesses. And so sometimes he's going to do things that you might not even understand as a player, but he's doing them because he sees the bigger picture, because he knows what's going on, because it's his will that's going to be done. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's to win this game of life. And you're a part of it when you become part of his kingdom. Your will be done not mine. It's interesting, but this is going to be a theme that's going to come up over and over again. It came up last week. It was one of the principles that we talked about last week is recognizing God's sovereignty. It's coming up again today, and I'm pretty sure it's going to come up again as we look at some other passages coming up the next couple of weeks. The challenge in life is that when things fall apart, when an injustice has been handed our way, when we feel like we've been hurt or burned, when we're going through pain or suffering that's undeserved, Change our focus, recognize his sovereignty, and pray, your will be done. Because our Father is in heaven and sees everything. And then as the Lord's Prayer continues on, he says, give us this day our daily bread. I mean, we know it, we pray it a lot, but what does that mean? It means recognizing God's provision. You know, one of the things, again, about unforgiveness is that as you become more focused on yourself and all the things that have gone wrong and everything that people have done against you and how you can't harbor that and per- forgive that person for whatever reasons, one of the problems is you forget to recognize that God has given you whatever you've got in the first place. It's God who gives you the possessions that you have. It's God who gives you the knowledge, the power, the health, the talents, the gifts. It's God that's given them to you. And the problem with unforgiveness is we change our focus to focusing on the negative that's happening on us rather than focusing and giving thanks to God for the things that we have every single day, for the very air that we breathe as we walk down the street. Unforgiveness and bitterness taints the way we see the world. 
and taints our relationship with God and makes it so that we cannot see God's provision every single day. Steve Corbett writes, One Sunday he was visiting one of Africa's largest slums, the massive Kiberian slum of Nairobi in Nairobi, Kenya. The conditions were simply inhumane. People lived in shacks constructed out of cardboard boxes. Foul smells gushed out of the open ditches carrying human and animal excrement. He thought to his, himself, this place is completely God forsaken. Then to his amazement, right there in the dung, he heard the sound of a familiar hymn. Every Sunday, 30 slum dwellers crammed into this 10 by 20 foot sanctuary, in quotes, to worship God. The church was made out of cardboard boxes that had been opened up and stapled to studs. Is that for your church? It wasn't pretty, but the church made up some of the poorest people on earth that he'd ever seen. Of course, because he was there, he was immediately asked to preach the sermon. He quickly jotted down some notes and was looking forward to teaching the congregation about the sovereignty of God. (laughs) But before the sermon began, he listened as some of the poorest people on the planet cried out to God, Jehovah Jireh, please heal my son as he's going blind. Merciful Lord, please protect me when I go home today for my husband's always beating me. Sovereign King, please provide my children with enough food today because they're hungry. As I listened to their heartfelt prayers, I thought about my ample salary, my life insurance policy, my health insurance policy, my two cars, my house. And I realized that I do not really trust in God's sovereignty on a daily basis, nor give him thanks for his provision. Give us this day our daily bread even in the slums of Nairobi, Kenya. Recognize God's provision when you're dealing with unforgiveness, when you're struggling with the pain and the injustice that's happened to you, when the people are talking behind your back or laughing or doing things that are hurting you or your family. Remember that it is still God who provides and looks after you in the great and in the small. And lastly, which is probably the most basic and the most obvious, but forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who sin against us. Remember, recognize God's forgiveness. He's the one that forgave you in the first place, and quite frankly, none of us deserved it. There's nothing I have ever done in my life that could ever justify God the Father sending his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to live with humanity in all its filth and muck and sinfulness, to die on a cross to forgive me. I didn't do anything to deserve that. I didn't do anything to deserve the fact that God at the age of 13 sort of came to me and I was convicted of my sin and asked him to forgive me And he forgave me, and it was all wiped clean. I didn't do anything to deserve that. When I come into God's presence every day, and I say, God, forgive me again, because I did it again. I fell on my face. I did this wrong. I need your forgiveness. I don't have to ask twice. He forgives. Remember that. God doesn't hold on to bitterness. God doesn't hold on to unforgiveness. No matter what you've done, no matter what you said, no matter what you thought, he forgives. It's so amazing because I didn't do anything to deserve it. There's a story about a traveler making his way through the guide with a guide through the jungles of Burma. They came to a shallow but wide river and waded through it to the other side. When the traveler came out the river, numerous leeches had attached to his torso and legs. His first instinct was to grab them and pull them off, but the guide stopped him, warning that pulling the leeches off would only leave pieces of the leeches in his skin, and eventually infection would set in and could be very bad. 
the best way to rid the body of the leeches, the guide advised, was to bathe in a warm balsam bath for several minutes. This would soak the leeches and soon they would release their hold on the man's body. When I've been significantly injured by another person, I cannot simply yank the injury from myself and accept all that bitterness, malice, and emotion will be gone. Resentment still hides under the surface. The only way to become truly free of the offense and to forgive others, listen to this, is to bathe in the soothing bath of God's forgiveness. This is where the power and the ability comes to forgive those that have done horrible things to us. Now, hopefully most of us never have to or have never been through anything as this extreme. But it still hurts when people betray us. It still hurts when people talk behind our backs. It still hurts when people refuse to talk to us. It still hurts when there seems to be no option or no chance for reconciliation. It still hurts when our expectations aren't met. It's still a part of living in a broken world. The challenge is for us to follow Jesus Christ is to live lives of forgiveness, and we do this by recognizing his will, by recognizing his provision, and by recognizing his forgiveness the Lord's Prayer. It's actually quite a genius thing because it reminds us of our need for God and it reminds us for our need for forgiveness and it reminds us, as Matthew writes here, of the need to forgive others no matter what goes on in life. So what do you do with that this week? Here's just a couple things to ask yourself as you go out of this place, as you go into the world. The first one, God, your will be done. Do you let God's will be done in your life? Ultimately, that means choosing your master. Who's the one who's going to rule your life? Who is it you're going to follow every single day? Is Jesus Christ the one who rules your life, or is it you? Or is it bitterness? Or is it resentment? Or is it unforgiveness? Who's your master? Our Father who art in heaven, your will be done. Give thanks. We sang about it this morning. Give us this day our daily bread. And God does give us our daily bread and so much more. So give thanks when you're provided for. When you're finding yourself in a difficult situation, facing injustice, facing the choice of whether to forgive or not to forgive, remember to give thanks for all that God has given you and your focus will change and the power will rise up inside of you and his Holy Spirit will rise up inside of you and you will be able not to just give thanks but also to forgive. Spend time this week not only just asking for forgiveness, but accepting God's forgiveness and giving thanks for it. Because in this way, his Holy Spirit and our relationship with Jesus flourishes and grows and expands and it does incredible things when you get a bunch of people who love Jesus so much they're willing to forgive and take the love of Jesus to those who meet, everyone that we meet. The hardest question probably of all today is, is there anyone that you need to forgive this morning? you've tried to bury in the past, tried to forget about, or maybe you've had some real strong words. Is there anyone that you need to forgive this morning? Because as Matthew writes, however way you look at it, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is amazing. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you came and you shared your life with your creation. We thank you that you spent time with 12 disciples that were so much like us. We thank you for Terry's testimony and his story this morning, as difficult as it is. But that somehow that man, through the principles that we've been talking about this morning, is able to forgive and then become a person that you're using to impact others in this world.
Father, this morning, we give thanks for your daily provision. We give thanks that you are sovereign. We recognize that you are our master. We give you thanks for the forgiveness that you have given us and shown us. Maybe you're here this morning or you're listening online. There's two questions directly for you. And the first one is, have you received Jesus' forgiveness? Have you invited him into your life? Because that's where forgiveness starts. When you understand that God has forgiven you, then you can forgive others. The second question is, who is it that you have to forgive this morning, this week? And what does that look like? Pound it out, wrestle it out with God, with Jesus, so that you can become all that you were made to be, so that you will be able to truly pray, your will be done, not mine. And so that as you receive forgiveness, you'll be able to give it. Because this is what will change the world. We are so thankful, Jesus, and give you praise. Amen.